Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm Al Gallimore, and I'm still the Robert J. Velasic Dean of Engineering, last time I checked. <laughs> I'm pleased to welcome you here to recognize colleague ming Liu Liu as the Alice L. Hunt Collegiate Professor of Engineering. That sounds pretty good. Why don't we give a round of applause for that? Okay, I'm told uh, that our husband Manish Career is here, so Manish? Not yet? Okay. Well, he's coming here, so. Uh, anyway, Manish, wherever you are, I'm so glad you can join us whenever you get here. As we know, collegiate professorships are among the highest honors the college bestows upon members of the faculty. They acknowledge a faculty member's contributions to research, teaching, and service, and they help us attract, reward, or retain outstanding faculty talent. Typically, these professorships are funded by the college, and often they are named after former faculty members who made substantial scholarly contributions while at Michigan. This collegiate professorship is named after instructor in engineering drawing, Alice L. Hunt. So let me tell you a little bit about Ms. Hunt. Alice Hunt was the first known woman instructor ever hired by the College of Engineering and was one of the first women instructors to be hired at the University of Michigan. Her initial appointment to the faculty of the University of Michigan dates back to February of 1889, when she was designated as an assistant to Professor C.E. Dennison. In October of that year, her title changed to assistant in drawing. Ms. Hunt was later promoted to instructor in engineering drawing, which she held until her retirement in February of 1919. At that time, when Ms. Hunt joined the University of Michigan, female students had only been formally welcomed to the university for 19 years. To paint a picture of what campus life was like back then, as described by some of the female students at the time, quote, the campus was then not much more than a big field surrounded with a high board fence to keep out the cattle and other livestock from freely roaming the streets in those days. Actually, I think people in Central Campus still think North Campus is like that, but that's a different story. And as another female student wrote, quote, it was oppressed upon the women of our department that the U of M was a men's school, and often we had the feeling that we're trying to rob men of a livelihood, end of quote. This speaks to the significance of Ms. Hunt's enduring presence at the college. She was one of the longest serving instructors at Michigan during the time period, and during World War I, she was one of three members of the staff in her department. While she never had the title of professor, she made significant contributions to the education of our students. During the early 20th century, engineering drawing was an essential part of engineering education and related fields, and critical to the emergence of engineering as a branch of the academy. She also had a special affinity for artwork. The watercolor called Willow, displayed at one time in the Alumni Memorial Hall, was purchased in her honor with funds that she left to the university. Dr. Liu selected Ms. Hunt in honor of her legacy of helping shaping the instruction at the College of Engineering, for her shared love of art, and of course for her role as a trailblazer in being possibly the first female instructor at the college. And personally, I am proud to see how far we've come in those terms in building a more diverse and equitable community. Today, we have male to female parity in our leadership. In fact, in fact, most of our department chairs are females. We graduate typically either the second most or the third most number of female engineers at the bachelor's level. And we have either the most or the second highest number of tenure tenure track female members of any engineering college in the country. So we've come a long way since those days. However, I'm grateful for trailblazers such as Ms. Hunt, and I'm thrilled to honor her today and to recognize another trailblazer and distinguished leader, Professor Liu, with this collegiate professorship and name. Congratulations to the Alice L. Hunt Collegiate Professor of Engineering, Dr. ming An Liu. Congratulations. And now we'll hear from Stéphane Lafortune, the N. Harris McClamark Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Professor, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Stéphane? Do you want the mic? Or? Yeah, I guess I will. Okay. Probably should. Thank you, Ali. I guess you all know me, but if you don't, I'm Stéphane Lafortune, <laughs> faculty member in EECS. And again, I would like to extend my welcome to everyone here today. And Manish, whenever he gets here, 
So it is my distinct honor today to introduce to you the first recipient of the Alice L. Hunt Professorship, Collegiate Professorship, Professor Minyan Lu of the EECS department. Minyan joined the university in 2000 after obtaining her PhD at the University of Maryland. It was the beginning of a new century. And I, indeed, Minyan brought new energy and opened new avenues of investigation in the systems group of the EECS department. I was assigned to be one of her faculty mentors, but clearly Minyan did not need much mentoring. Her accomplishments in her career so far have been absolutely remarkable, and they cover all facets of our job, research, teaching, service, entrepreneurship, and administration. Minyan has achieved an international reputation in the area of communication networks, her work has focused on optimal resource allocation, sequential decision theory, incentive design, and performance modeling and analysis. Her papers exhibit rigorous analytical development, well-grounded in important practical problems in communication networks. As an example, soon after she joined Michigan, Minyan did pioneering work excuse me, in the area of mobility modeling in wireless networking. Later on, <clears throat> later on, she was co-developer of the first ever large-scale soil moisture sensor network. And speaking of cattle earlier, this work took Minyan to cattle farms in Oklahoma and California. In 2014, she was a co-founder with Manish of the cybersecurity startup company Quadmetric. More recently, she has been working on active online learning modeling and mining of large-scale internet measurement data with focus on cybersecurity. She published a book titled Embracing Risk, Cyber Insurance as an Incentive Mechanism for Cybersecurity two years ago. And she currently is the Peter and Evelyn Fuss Chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering, a position she has occupied since 2018. And this means she went from being my mentee to being my boss, right? <laughs> in parallel to her world-class research program, successful entrepreneurship efforts, and book writing, Minyan has developed a broad teaching portfolio covering the gamut from Engineering 100 to required undergraduate classes, in probability no less, and to advanced graduate classes. So you will all agree with me that this is absolutely remarkable. Minyan, we are very proud of your accomplishments so far in your career, and we know that you will continue to impress us. Today is a new milestone for you. We're delighted to be here to listen to your talk and participate in the celebration. Now we are eager to listen to you and hear your views on cybersecurity and risk management from data to policy. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Minyan. Thank you very much for the remarks, Dean Gallimore and Stefan. I am deeply grateful. And thank you all for coming, uh, including my husband, who just stepped in, <laughs> who had already been acknowledged. Um, so this, this is a special day for me. Um, I am very honored to be here. Um, as uh, Stefan just alluded to, uh, my background is in communication networks, particularly large-scale network systems. There are two strands um, underneath most of what I've been doing. One is mathematical modeling of these engineered systems um, and that then eventually enables um, efficient algorithm design, efficient network protocols. The other strand is incentive mechanisms. Um, Early on, we use incentive mechanisms as a way to design more efficient resource allocation problems um, among distributed users, devices, or tasks, and resources, in this case, refer to time, energy, bandwidth, and so on. Um, over the last 10 years, I have moved a bit closer to incentivizing the actual end user. And both strands are reflected in the subject uh, of today's um, talk. So I'm going to talk about risk. Having gone through 
the pandemic for the last few years, I think all of us will say, I'm an expert in risk. I know what it is. And the definition is the possibility of something bad happens. But I think you would also agree, uh, having gone through this period of significant risk, risk can be something that is very intractable and tricky to quantify. And this, the same is true in the case of cyber risk. If you look at the bad things that can happen in a cyber system, it has to do with a loss of confidentiality, integrity, availability of information data or control, and this is by the definition of the NIST cybersecurity framework. And the risk is associated with adverse impacts to organizations' ability to operate their assets, individuals, other organizations, and so forth. You put this in a context of a modern organization um, that includes thousands, if not tens of thousands of digital devices, uh, as well as human, uh, human operators, employees, think about U of M. The job of quantifying, measuring that risk can become enormous um, and is oftentimes not very well defined. Traditionally, um, a very prominent method is in penetration testing. So this is essentially a company hires a third party, organization hires a third party, coming up with a very well orchestrated plan, detailed attack plan, if you will, and try to poke at the system and see what fails, okay? What vulnerabilities they can identify. And these tend to be extremely costly and time consuming tasks, not really affordable uh, to a lot of small, smaller organizations highly targeted, as I said, carefully orchestrated, and it also requires very high levels of access. Typically, you need a team to come on site, do things within the organization. More broadly uh, associated with uh, penetration testing is the idea uh, I think many of you may have heard is called ethical hacking. It's very similar, but ethical hackers can uh, oftentimes at their disposal a lot of other tools they, uh, they feel free to use. The main limiting factor of this type of traditional approach is one is clearly not scalable. You cannot do it for many, many organizations all at once, um, and it's costly, obviously. Another um, not always visible limitation is that this type of exercise is ultimately constrained by the imagination of the attacker or the tester. Okay? They can only do things they think can lead to the identification of vulnerability. Okay? And as we have seen, cyber threats are constantly evolving. Um, every other week, we see another authentic sounding emails pretending to be from Dean Gallimore, or uh, our dear colleague here, um, uh, asking for help, asking for money, right? All right, so while these approaches are being developed and then continue to be refined over the last 20 years also, um, in parallel to these developments is the rise of data. Um, the, so we start, researchers start to collect any a variety of data. Um, and one prominent category is internet scanning. And what this does is essentially you have this piece of algorithm uh, software that allows you to send out data packets to ping any host on the public internet, any IP address on the internet. And depending on how that packet is received and responded to, you can infer a lot of information about what software services are configured on a particular port, um, how they are configured, and so on. Um, as some of you may know, each IP address, each device you carry can have up to thousands of ports supporting many, many different services. So this type of data collection gives us very detailed view of what's out there, how things are configured. Two most commonly used such packages, one is MMAP, uh, that dates back to more than 20 years ago. And then ZMAP came onto the scene about 10 years ago, uh, which is a much 
faster, efficient version of NMAP. And this is a shout out to our colleagues in computer science. Uh, ZMAP actually came out of Alec Hodman's group. It's a major internet scanning tool. Okay. As I said, the, what this gives us is very detailed host level by what I mean by host is individual machine, um, information on misconfiguration and mismanagement. What I mean by these two words is essentially you get a sense of how things are managed with respect to known best practices. A very prominent example is printers. There are all these printers that are accessible through the open internet. You can ping them and you can, you can tell that their password has never been reset. <laughs> it's manufactured uh, uh, default password. Um, so these are the type of problems you know well, okay, is it really a vulnerability? Not necessarily, and yet it is clearly a deviation from known best practices, okay? So if we can do risk quantification relying on this type of data, then your exercise one becomes much more scalable because we're talking about data that reflects the entire internet. Um, moreover, an interesting thing here is this type of data is clearly non-causal, okay? As I just said, a printer left unconfigured may or may not be a direct vulnerability, even though I think researchers have shown that you can send a, a PDF with malware to set a printer on file. That's an extreme case. Another example of the type of data that we have access to uh, is called what's called reputational blacklist RBLs. These are collected by internet sensors located all over the internet, filtering traffic to detect malicious activities like spam, phishing, etc. And what they come up with is these daily digest of IP addresses seem to be engaged in one of these malicious activities. Right. Um, again, this type of data, if not particularly uh, scalable, it does rely on the, the, this type of infrastructure, they are global, it covers the entire global internet. Um, and they are explicit signs of botnet activity. Okay, if your computer is being used to send out spam, there's botnet infection. Now, botnet infection doesn't mean you are going to get your data stolen. So there's still a bit of semi-causal, non-causal feature to this type of data, uh, but it is a sign that something is not quite right. So the question is, do these data if put together, can they measure organizational risk? You think of a large organization. Well, the first thing that has to be done is because all these data, and there are other data of this nature, the two most prominent ones that I just showed as examples, some type of aggregation is needed along organizational boundaries. Okay, I have to be able to tell whether this IP address belongs to the University of Michigan and so on. So some type of aggregation is needed. Uh, but the, some of the challenges here, one is these data are highly heterogeneous, as I just showed. Um, they capture different aspects of the cyber operation. So they're not along the same dimension. The second thing, more critically, is any time you summarize data, there's not a unique way of doing so, okay? And then it becomes a challenge to, to, to tell apart what is a better way to do and what ultimately can we get out of it. Here's an example. What I show here is one particular type of summarization, which is I simply count the unique IP addresses that have been listed on these blacklists that belong to a particular organization. And what I show here is three example organizations. These are actually real data. And you, you show, what I show here is what happens in a period of two months. Okay? Um, and you can forget about the, the actual scale. The scale is the absolute count. So usually we have to normalize this by the size of an organization. But if you look at these three examples, you have this intuitive sense that they behave differently. The first one, very few numbers of IP addresses that are impacted. And they come and go. And some of this may just be detection noise. The second one is very different. It is extremely high volume. Okay, 800 also IP addresses for a period of close to two months that consistently are listed on these blacklists. 
What does it tell us is that the organization either is not aware these IP addresses are listed, or they are, but either they don't know what to do about them, or they don't have the manpower to, to, to address the issue. Some of you may have had the experience when you try to send an email, sometimes you get a bounce back saying the email cannot be sent because your address has been listed. And that's exactly what happens here. And what do you do? You call, we call it DCO, and Don will be very quick to get that IP address delisted. And that's the kind of thing that you don't see in the second example. In the third example, the volume is high and normalized, you know, this is probably a very large organization. And you see the, you see the change. It goes up and goes down. And perhaps that is suggesting that even though they are trying to manage the situation, uh, they can't quite keep it low. Things keep resurfacing. So the intuition is clear, uh, but we, and how do you convey this uh, was something we, uh, we took, it took a lot of tries on our part. Well, we worked on this for close to two years. We tried all kinds of first order, second order statistic, tried similarity analysis, clustering. Um, it was never convincing enough for the research community, okay? Then came a conceptual leap. So this, we started doing this uh, exercise around 2012. 2014 came, and that was perhaps the year where high profile data breaches became uh, very visible, okay? That was the year, I don't know, this is close to 10 years ago, and since then we have had many more bigger data breaches. But that was the year where Target breach happened, followed by JP Morgan Chase breach, followed by Home Depot, Anthem. Um, I think this was a turning point. Um, it was very clear that the impact, the social and economic impact of these data breaches were increasing very rapidly. Um, over a four year span, uh, the increase was 95%. More relevant to our study was this coincided with a, a, this onset of data recording. So these data breaches began to be reported more widely and more consistently. This then gave rise to, I would say, a simple idea, really, but it was a conceptual uh, switch for us, which is supervised learning. And for those of you who have done um, any bit of uh, machine learning, you will know why this is, uh, this is a key difference. So, this led to a data breach prediction framework. Essentially, we took these images, if you like. Think of these as dog pictures, right? These are features or daytime series data, any number of them for a particular organization. Um, these are the ones without known breaches, and we are very careful to align the data in time. And then on the other side, you take your cat pictures, essentially. These are the features of uh, the, the aggregated data that we have for companies with reported breaches. And then you feed them into um, a standard supervised learning framework, right? Um, and this is what we call breach, uh, features and breach, no breaches labels. Then you can generate your classifier, and then you give it an unknown uh, feature of a company with unknown status, it can give us prediction, okay? And the output is likelihood of breach. And this was finally something that became very convincing, both to the research community as well as to the commercial world. How well does it work? The output is a number between zero and one, uh, reflecting the probability of having a material data breach. What you see here is the difference in terms of the predicted output among the victim group versus the non-victim group. So victim is ones that had a reported data breach. So the wide separation tells you that this methodology is conveying a lot of information. Um, much of the, the non-victim group is predicted as low risk and much of the victim group predicted as having high risk. Um, and as many of you, you know, the way you, um, you gauge, you assess how precisely the accuracy of this 
methodology is you take a through you take a threshold you call everything high above high risk everything below low risk you get a binary output once you have binary then you can compare with your actual samples to um, to tease out right this is would be the false positive non victim but predicted high risk false negative and so on okay and then you move your threshold you get essentially the receiver operating the ROC curve, right? Before I leave this, let me tell you what these markers are. And this is a study done in 2015. Um, this is OPM, Office of Personnel Management, one of the largest federal agency data breaches. Uh, this is Scott's Trade. This is T-Mobile, Experian, Anthem, and the last one, Penn State. <laughs> Universities don't usually do well because our networks are, you know, constructed as open architecture. So, and so, this was uh, this allowed this this pivot from unsupervised learning to supervised learning, but the pairing of data breach as label as well as these host level information, I think the pairing was a conceptual uh, jump for us, uh, and it was the first time such a study was done. Um, you can do even better. You can throw more data into this, use this type of uh, methodology. For instance, we can predict what's, what we call risk profiles, essentially looking at, relatively speaking, if an incident should occur, the likelihood of it being of a particular type. And that re the reason for that is because not all incidents are created equal. Some are more costly than others. Um, a lot of them require very different types of prevention and mitigation. So here's an example. And uh, the, the different columns are different types of incident that actually combines both cyber and non-cyber incidents. The rows are, I have two sectors here, information public admin, and I have two specific examples within each sector. The cells that are grayed out are what's predicted by our methodology as relatively high risk, and the X's mark the actual incident happen. The thing to point out here is if you look at the information sector as a whole, it is particularly prone to hacking and social. But if you look at the major US ISP, this is actually a Verizon, it is actually at high risk to just about everything. It has to do with its size and, and the, the variety of businesses that they, uh, they, they conduct. Um, equally interestingly, if you look at this example, public administration as a sector is generally high risk to everything. Okay? But this particular agency is only high risk to two, error and misuse. The actual incident is a case of misuse. Who, can, who would like to venture to guess which agency this is? It's the, sorry. Give us a hint. It's one of the largest U.S. agencies. It's much beviled. It's RRS. RRS. The IRS, IRS. yes. IRS. Right. So this, is t this type of tools can give an organization a much more targeted uh, sense of what their own risks are. How do we put it to use? Uh, and that's how policies come into play. Um, this technology is currently used for enterprise risk management to inform strategic resource allocation uh, decisions, so on, uh, such as should I perform software upgrade versus personnel training? Uh, much of social engineering has to do with training your people. Uh, it is being used in vendor supply chain management uh, because cyber risk should be a key decision factor in selecting and managing vendors. We saw that in Home Depot, in, in, um, in and target breaches are all vendor breaches. Um, and interestingly enough, we did not actually see this uh, when we did this, but it is now being used to become, it's becoming part of what's called ESG ratings, uh, which stands for environmental social governance. It's a type of ratings that, um, that have been uh, being produced to gauge a company's social responsibility. For instance, a very uh, prominent example is carbon emission. 
and that goes much into a company's environmental score, um, a carbon footprint score. And the way these companies are then held responsible is, I would say, through shareholder activism. And we have a few very prominent examples in the recent past. Um, it's very ha uh, I'm very happy to see that cyber is, over time, hopefully going to become part of the ESG ratings. But for the next um, 10 minutes, I want to talk about, last but not least, cyber insurance, which is a fascinating beast and a highly mathematical problem. Um, for some time, for quite some time, cyber insurance was viewed as the only free market instrument left standing to address the cyber security investment problem. Everything else failed. People talk about uh, cap and trade, mandate, um, and that's why it's an important thing to study. I'm going to start with a bit of history. Insurance is a very, very, very old economic instrument. Um, this picture here is the statutes you can find in the Louvre and on which you can find a very old piece of legal text dating back to, attributed to King Hammurabi. It's a Babylonian legal text. Apparently, this was considered the first written record of what an insurance policy is, and it has to do with marine insurance. If a merchant receives a loan to fund his shipment, he would pay the lender some money in compensation for the lender providing a guarantee that he would cancel the loan if the shipment sank or was stolen. That's basically insurance. Okay. Mathematically, what is insurance? It's a contract between two parties. Sometimes we call this principal agent problem in, ga in game theory, called this Stackelberg game. Um, on one hand, on one side, you have insured the principal. On the other hand, you have the insured or the agent. The exchange is the insured pays a premium to the principal in exchange for the principal to take over the risk that the agent would have um, without this exchange. Okay? One thing that's interesting, important to note is insurance is fundamentally a risk transfer instrument. The risk hasn't gone down. You think about the marine insurance. Whatever the risk there is remains the same. It's just that I pay you money, so you now have the risk. I don't have to worry about the risk. In the cybersecurity domain, what interests us has always been can I use this as a risk reduction mechanism, not just a transfer mechanism? So to understand that, a few quick uh, notes about well-known uh, issues about insurance. One is information asymmetry. The agent knows what the principal doesn't know. So the agent uh, supposedly knows more about his own risk. Okay? In this case, you have a benign event, the loss is zero. You have an adverse event, you lose $100, okay? Maybe your risk is half-half. The principal doesn't know this. What that means is you can have two prominent problems. One is called moral hazard, um, meaning that because the action of the agent is unobservable to the principal, the minute I have somebody else take over my risk, I'm going to behave, start behaving irresponsibly. So that's called moral hazard. Um, now that I pay $60, to purchase the insurance policy and I, my loss is fully covered, I'm going to behave riskily so that my actual risk has now increased, right? The second problem is adverse selection. And we have heard this repeatedly in the, in, in the healthcare insurance debate, which is that the riskier individuals tend to seek insurance because they know their risks are high, so they want more courage. So that's another typical problem. Some of the, limit, uh, the mitigation is what's called premium discrimination. So if I have a way to assess your risk, then I'm going to charge you a higher premium based on that. Um, the ability to do so is quite limited. But the technology we, uh, we built and I showed can actually allow um, underwriters to, to do uh, premium discrimination. The more interesting aspect of this has to do with a unique characteristic of cyber risk which is interdependency. If you think about how we operate, how we do business, how we communicate, a lot of what we do these days have been outsourced to 
vendors and suppliers, to third parties and third parties, third parties, fourth parties, fifth parties, right? Uh, and a lot of these third parties are shared, common third parties. And that is not even mentioning technology dependence. Uh, how many companies use Microsoft Outlook? How many of us use Adobe and so on, right? This type of risk dependency is really not seen in other types of risk domains, okay? They're usually conditionally independent. And that makes the problem extremely uh, fascinating on top of the fact that cyber risk as well as risk control are completely man-made, right? Okay, so the question is, what does it mean for risk transfer now that I have this dependency? And here is another conceptual leap, which is that if you think about, uh, and this is a well-known phenomenon in the context of game theories called public goods provision game, you have individuals whose welfare is dependent on each other's action. And if the dependency is of a particular asymmetric type, what you get is free riding, okay? Um, we count on our neighbor's goodwill and good action to keep the water clean from upstream or air clean, or we count on the next uh, county to have a public library, so we don't need to have one. You know, we, we see these public goods provision uh, phenomena all around us. And so if you leave them unregulated, their investment effort tends to be extremely inefficient. Okay? And that essentially creates a gap, we call it profit gap, or an opportunity for, the insur for, the, for an insurance policy to act as control. And indeed, what we can show very rigorously that if you get both agents to participate in insurance, then the situation is good for everybody. Uh, the risk and risk assessment is what enables this type of control. Simply speaking, the underwriter can essentially incentivize the party who is more crucial in this dependent relationship to lower their risk. And by doing so, it lowers the risk of both parties. And that gives them a, a margin in, in, the, uh, in the premium to essentially incentivize both of them to participate, okay? And so the result is improved collective effort, security, state of security, and actually higher profit. Um, is this the state of the uh, theory? Yes, is this the state of practice? Unfortunately, no, we have a long way to go, but this is a conversation we continue to have with practitioners. Uh, one thing I wish I hope to highlight in in in, a, in this type of work is the 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 notion of externality and more externality. The idea that what I do impacts people around me and vice versa, and therefore our actions um, takes on particular significance. And this is seen very clearly in the domain of cybersecurity and security investment. Uh, left unregulated, generally, this type of invest investment is considered to have um, neg a negative outcome because we shirk our responsibilities. And what I showed is with carefully designed policies, uh, we can come up with effective ways to actually reduce risk. So again, this was a risk transfer instrument, but because of the dependency, you can actually turn it into a risk reduction instrument. And that takes me to some of our ongoing work that continues in this direction of understanding and quantifying externalities. Uh, one fascinating example is ransomware. Can you imagine what a ransomware insurance policy would look like? The externality is simply enormous. You have the service provider that can be hit uh, with an attack, and it has downstream customers whose business are now being interrupted. Uh, you have an insurance uh, company who potentially could intervene and serve as the negotiator. And then you have attackers and these uh, boutique business that popped up, uh, it's called RAA, Ransom as a Service Companies. Okay? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating problem, and every time one company makes one decision, it has huge spillover effect on other ongoing negotiations and downstream uh, attacks, uh, because the ransom you fetch is completely 
dependent on how much you're willing to pay for. Um, and another area we're working in, this is a MURI project that uh, Mike and I have with other colleagues on multi-agent strategic interaction over networks. So this is now looking at a much larger ecosystem, not just two-party interaction, but um, many agents interacting over network, not just network, but networks with group structures, uh, groups and groups of groups. How do we understand, reason about, um, and analyze their strategic interactions with various types of externalities? Um, and another thing that I haven't actually done anything concrete about, but this is a problem that really fascinates me. It's something I would really like to do something about. Um, um, I attempted a uh, grand challenge. I have since backed off from that um, and narrowed its scope. And this has to do with, again, the externality in terms of the social cause of the breaches and the other cyber incidents. You know, you have a credit card stolen, it can fetch $50 within the next five minutes, okay? You call your credit card company, it says, done, it's canceled, you get a new card next week. You feel that you're not paying anything. Well, but you are. You're paying it through increased, uh, you know, late fees, increased uh, interest rates, and so on. A, and the, 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 for any of, uh, and hopefully there isn't any here, but for some of um, us who have been hit with identity theft, it takes not just thousands of dollars, but years of your life to try to clean that up. And it has ramifications to people around you, their physical, psychological well-being. Another prominent example is whenever our healthcare information gets stolen, Guess what it's being used for? Why is this so valuable? It's being used to primarily file fraudulent health insurance claims. And, and who's paying for it? All of us, right? Uh, we pay it through increased premium year after year. So this is, it says it's an area where I feel um, it's one of those Gains are heavily privatized and costs are heavily socialized. And I think it is extremely important to get a better hold on what really is this totality of social cost around um, data breaches and social uh, and cyber incidents. Well, um, that ends but the technical part of this. Um, obviously, I have many, many people to thank. I want to highlight three. Um, the first is Demos, um, who retired a few years ago. I owe much of what I know about stochastic control, game theory, mechanism design to my interaction, discussion, uh, and collaboration with Demos. Um, I also learned in an, an enormous amount from him about what it means to be a good advisor, to be a good teacher, and good citizen. Um, second person is Dave. Uh, for those of you who don't know, even though Dave and I work in very different areas, he's an information theorist, it was with Dave I got my first successful NSF project funded. And that set me on a path of wireless sensor networks for many years uh, after that. And speaking of sensor networks, the third person I want to highlight is Mata, a dear colleague of ours and who's now um, at USC. She and I, with Mata, I had uh, one of, I think, the longest running projects, a nine-year NASA project on soy moisture sensor. And it was also with her, we did a lot of field work. So there is a particular, very special camaraderie between uh, Mata and me. Um, obviously, um, a lot of the, the work is done by uh, students. Uh, the top row are my recently graduated students. Um, very happy to see them landing uh, on their feet. Uh, I'm also very happy to observe that I think all of them are now in academia, although three of them are at Ohio State. That's a good thing. Um, the bottom row are my current set of students. Uh, Quinn, far left, he has just successfully defended on Monday, so very happy to see that. A big thank you to all of them. Um, 
This cannot be complete without showing. I only have two, not four. These are the same two kids uh, who are now more grown up. Uh, and my um, wonderful husband and partner, uh, Manish, who doesn't get a lot of real estate on this one, but he's here. Um, and I'm, I was very, um, uh, very grateful to hear the remarks that Alec gave about Alice Hunt. Um, I should also say a few words, and I will not repeat what you already said. She, from what we can tell, is one of the, the earliest uh, uh, female faculty on, uh, in engineering. Um, Alex already mentioned this many years. Most of her time here was instructor in engineering drawing. To give you a perspective of timing, uh, drawing predates many of the modern, or engineering predates many of the modern engineering disciplines. The first course in drawing offered at U of M is descriptive and analytical geometry, 1843. The first EE undergraduate degree program was approved by the regents uh, almost 50 years later. And this was before uh, EE became a department. What I find most interesting about her story is Art uh, for, the, for her in particular, and perhaps for more than just her, was a way uh, for a woman to become part of engineering. And that is, uh, is I think, particularly um, interesting to note. She, uh, her background is in art. Uh, she taught in Massachusetts, and she was a supervisor of joining Ann Arbor Public Schools for many years. When she retired in 1919, there was an interview reported on the Daily. This was March issue of 1919. The Michigan Daily existed then. And um, the interview noted that she was indeed uh, the, the longest serving uh, faculty, with the exception of an English professor, uh, Demon. And there are some interesting quotes in there. She says, this campus was once encircled with a double driveway, entirely, you know, with encircled in the picket fence. Throwing freshmen over the fence was a favorite sophomore diversion. <laughs> and she noted winter was now becoming more, mi uh, more mild. She recalls once an ice crust formed so thickly upon the snow that it was possible to skate from Central to Ipsy. <laughs> Last. She declared that she can faculty salaries more adequate in the old days than they are now. In the early history, the instructor received $900 upon being engaged and then a raise of 100 with each succeeding years. More than 10% raise, Alec. <laughs> Most importantly, um, in addition to her 30 years of dedicated service to university, she had left a legacy. Uh, so these were actually two paintings by her that's in the University Museum of Arts collection. Uh, and as Alec also noted, she actually left a gift uh, to the university for the purchase of art pieces. And this was uh, many years later, I think this was after she, uh, her passing, it was used to purchase a uh, professor's uh, watercolor willow. Uh, with that, uh, let me just say, I feel, uh, obviously, none of us knew her, know her. I feel this is an individual that was um, gifted, uh, kind, and generous. Um, what she left behind uh, was 30 years of service to this beloved institution, as well as uh, actual uh, legacy. And by taking on her name, I hope um, that I will be able to say um, that I have done the same uh, by the time I reach the end of my career. Thank you very much.